Thank you for watching The Word and Sword. This Bible study program is brought to you by the Newton Church of Christ. We invite you to call in during this program to ask your Bible questions. Call 828-465-3009 and one of our members will be happy to talk to you. That's 828-465-3009. In this episode of The Word and Sword, there are three different Bible studies. The first study focuses on Judas and his betrayal of the Lord. While we tend to see him as completely reprehensible, we need to pause and realize we are not much different from him. From this account, we can learn valuable lessons, including the subtle influence of Satan, the fact we often do not see the full consequences of our sins before or even while we are committing them, and that we cannot simply undo or erase our sin. Next, we study a lesson from the life of Abraham. He stands out as a giant in biblical and world history. The event we examine in this lesson could be easily overlooked and considered an ordinary happenstance with little meaning. However, as we will see, the incidental story is significant in the scheme of redemption and is a wonderful display of how God works in the kingdoms of men to bring about His will. The final lesson is an introduction to a series on First and Second Peter. It is a general look at the background and life of Peter to help us see who it was that wrote the letters. Before we get into the Bible studies on this episode, however, there is a short personal introduction to help you know a little more about me. Again, we thank you for watching the Word and Sword program. We encourage you to call 828-465-3009 and ask your Bible questions. Call during the program to connect live with one of our members or call anytime, leave a message and we will get back to you. You may also leave a comment on our Facebook page at facebook.com slash word and sword or send us an email at contact at word and Right now, we invite you to grab your Bible to study with us and call 828-465-3009 with your Bible questions. I want to begin the program tonight by introducing myself. My name is Stephen Deaton. And I spent my middle school and high school years in North Carolina, went to high school at Northwest Cabarrus, graduated from there. After some time of floundering around after high school, I ended up joining the Air Force, spent some time in there as a weather forecaster, and then started preaching. Uh, I've just recently moved back to North Carolina, even though I've been doing this program for about six months now. I did just recently move back and am working with the Newton Church of Christ, which is, of course, in Newton, North Carolina. Um, we are a relatively small congregation and simply want to seek to do the Lord's will. We take the New Testament as our sole source of authority in religious matters. And because of that, we're different from other churches that you might see around us. Uh, we have simple worship, simple work, and a simple organization because we are just striving to follow what is written in the Word of God. Uh, we don't try to be modern. We don't try to keep up with the latest and greatest types of things that others are doing to attract attention or to draw people in. We simply rely on the Word of God, as Romans 1.16 says, For I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God into salvation. We use the gospel to appeal to others. And those whose hearts are aligned with that and simply want to know what's written in God's Word and how to live to be pleasing to God, that's what we are about. And our hope is to help you to serve the Lord. And so we invite you to visit our services. On Sunday mornings, we meet at 10 a.m. for Bible class and then at 11 a.m. for worship. 
uh, in our worship right now, we're going through a series of lessons on the sacrifice of the Son, focusing on the crucifixion of Jesus Christ. And so we would hope you could join us for that. Uh, we have a Wednesday uh, assembly where we meet at 7 p.m. Again, that's for Bible class. Under the present circumstances, our class is in the auditorium. Uh, people can spread out, things like that. Uh, we don't have any children's classes present. Uh, we hope to very soon, as soon as uh, circumstances allow. But uh, right now it is an adult class, which is really suitable for anyone um, really in even in their preteen years, it's a, it's a class that would be helpful and encouraging to them. And of course, for those who are older, those who are adults. Um, so we invite you to visit our services sometime. But we also invite you to go to our website, wordandsword.com. And on that website, you'll find a lot of Bible study materials, uh, including past episodes of this program with lots of rich content in there that you can watch. Um, and we invite you to have personal studies. Uh, again, under the present circumstances, uh, that may need to be via an online video, you know, something like Zoom that we get together and we study the Word of God through that medium. Or if we can arrange it, uh, we can have an in-person study with you as well. So just reach out and let us know. You can give us a call at our phone number, or you can uh, send us an email and let us know that you want to study or even go to our Facebook page and make a comment there to let us know that you would like to study. But be that as it may, uh, again, my name is Stephen Deaton. I look forward to hearing from you and to being on this program to help to teach the Word of God, that you may have a deeper and richer knowledge of His will and that you may be able to draw closer to Him. This Bible study program is brought to you by the Newton Church of Christ, located in Newton, North Carolina. We invite you to call 828-465-3009 to talk to one of our members and ask your Bible question. Some of the questions we receive will be used on a future episode of the program to help others who may have the same question. Again, that number is 828-465-3009. Have you ever noticed or have you ever thought about the fact that there is one apostle that stands out from all the rest? He's the only apostle about which the Old Testament prophesied. And he's the only apostle that did not see the resurrected Lord. When we read through the gospel accounts, his name is the one that appears last whenever all the apostles are listed or named out. And his name and his action are synonymous with betrayal. Of course, we're talking about Judas. And what we want to do in this lesson is go through the gospel accounts as they record Judas's betrayal, his treachery against the Lord. We want to notice them as they unfolded, but then we're going to back up and look at some lessons that you and I need to learn that are valuable to us about sin and Satan and how Satan lures us into sin, and of course, that ends up harming ourselves and harming others who are around us, and it destroys our relationship with the Lord. We're going to see all of this in the account of Judas and his betrayal of Jesus Christ. So to begin with, let's go to Luke chapter 22, Luke 22, and read verses 1 through 6. It says, Now the feast of unleavened bread drew near, which is called Passover. And the chief priests and the scribes sought how they might kill him, for they feared the people. Then Satan entered Judas, surnamed Iscariot, who was numbered among the twelve. So he went his way and conferred with the chief priests and captains how he might betray him to them. And they agreed, or they were glad and agreed to give him money. So he promised and sought opportunity to betray him to them in the absence of the multitude. So we see Jesus here is 
preparing to be with his disciples and to observe the Passover. But as that Passover is approaching, Judas has decided to go to the chief priests and the captains, as it says here, to the Jewish leaders and has made an arrangement with them that he would betray Jesus to them in the absence of the multitude. Of course, he agreed to do this for a sum of money. Now, one of the things that is interesting in John's gospel account, in John chapter 11, is the fact that the Jewish leaders had given a command to the people, had issued, I guess, a a statement or orders or however it is they would convey it to the people that they were to tell them where Jesus was because they were seeking to destroy him. In John chapter 11, verse 57 said, now both the chief priests and the Pharisees had given a command that if anyone knew where he was, he should report it that they might seize him. Remember, this is after the resurrection of Lazarus, and they wanted to get rid of Jesus at this point. They had gone from the animosity toward Jesus and generally wanting to get rid of him in some way to a very specific plot, uh, very determined action to kill him, to get rid of him. So they issued this command that if anyone knew where he was, that they were to report it to the Jewish leaders so they could go and get him, arrest him, of course, and have him put to death. But Judas probably knew of that command and responded to it. And that's why he went to them. He knew they would be favorable to receive him. And he went, of course, and arranged to betray Jesus. And he did this for a sum of money, as Matthew 26 points out to us in verse 14. Then one of the twelve called Judas Iscariot went to the chief priest and said, what are you willing to give me if I deliver him to you? And they counted out to him 30 pieces of silver. From that time, he sought opportunity to betray him. So Judas is proactive here. He is going out to seek an opportunity to betray Jesus. He goes to these chief priests. He strikes that deal for the 30 pieces of silver. And it's interesting when you go back to the Old Testament in Exodus chapter 21, that this price of 30 pieces of silver was the price that was put on a slave that had been gored by an ox. In other words, this is an injured slave. That's the price of them. So that's the price for which Judas was willing to betray Jesus Christ. So he went and he made that agreement and he looked for an opportunity to fulfill that agreement, to fulfill that contract essentially that he entered in with the Jewish leaders. Now, if we go back over to John chapter 13, John chapter 13, we're going to see here that Judas was identified. That is, Jesus identified his betrayer, first of all, to the other apostles, but then also to Judas himself. And we'll look at the details of that in just a moment. But John chapter 13 and verse 18 beginning, we want to read all the way down through 26. And notice as Jesus is sitting down and eating the Passover with his disciples, that he's talking about the betrayal that is about to come. And then, of course, he identifies Judas as the one who would betray him. In John 13 verse 18, I do not speak concerning all of you. I know whom I have chosen, but that the scripture may be fulfilled. He who eats bread with me has lifted up his heel against me. Now I tell you before it comes that when it does come to pass, you may believe that I am he. Most assuredly, I say to you, he who receives whomever I send receives me and he who receives me receives him who sent me. When Jesus had said these things, he was troubled in spirit and testified and said, Most assuredly, I say to you, one of you will betray me. Then the disciples looked at one another, perplexed about whom he spoke. Now there was leaning on Jesus' bosom one of his disciples whom Jesus loved. Simon Peter therefore motioned to him to ask who it was of whom he spoke. Then leaning back on Jesus' breast, he said to him, Lord, who is it? Jesus answered, It is he to whom I shall give a piece of bread when I have dipped it. 
And having dipped the bread, he gave it to Judas Iscariot, the son of Simon. So you see what's unfolding here, Jesus sitting there, and it's weighing heavily upon him about the betrayal that is about to take place. And as he's talking about this, and his disciples are wondering, well, who could that be? He's saying one of us is going to do it. Well, who is it that that could be? And John's account tells us that there is leaning on Jesus' bosom, one of his disciples whom Jesus loved. That's John. So as they're reclined there around the table and eating of that Passover meal, that John is right next to Jesus. And Peter motions to John, ask him who it is. Who is it that's going to betray him? So John leans over and he asks the Lord who it is. And the Lord specifically says, the one to whom I shall give a piece of bread when I've dipped it. And he dipped the bread and he gave it to Judas. So he identified Judas to John and, of course, to Peter as Peter's watching this unfold, as Peter's the one who prompted John to ask the Lord. So Judas has been identified as his betrayer at this point. And what we see going on here is that Satan is working on Judas as Jesus, remember, had washed Judas's feet just as he had done with all the disciples earlier in the evening, just a little bit actually before this event unfolded. But Jesus says, this is what the scripture has prophesied. That's where Judas was prophesied about in the Old Testament. He says that it would be fulfilled, that it would come about. And of course, the son of man being put on trial, being executed for the sins of man. So he's saying this prophecy must be fulfilled. And so we see Judas is still hardened in his heart as the Lord is being weighed down heavily by this. And Judas is identified. Judas does not change. Judas presses on. If you notice in Matthew chapter 26, where Jesus speaks to Judas about the fact that he would betray him. In Matthew chapter 26 and beginning in verse 20, we want to read down through verse 25. When evening had come, he sat down with the twelve. Now as they were eating, he said, Surely I say to you, one of you will betray me. And they were exceedingly sorrowful, and each of them began to say to him, Lord, is it I? He answered and said, He who dipped his hand with me in the dish will betray me. The Son of Man indeed goes, just as it is written of him, but woe to that man by whom the Son of Man is betrayed. It would have been good for that man if he had not been born. Then Judas, who was betraying him, answered and said, Rabbi, is it I? He said to him, You have said it. In other words, that's an affirmative. Yes. You want to know if you're the one? Yes, you, Judas, are the one. So, he declares this to Judas, and all the disciples, it's interesting, are wondering, is it me? Is it me? So that shows self-examination. But Judas, as he's examining himself, and he asks the Lord directly, Judas receives that affirmative answer. And it's at this point that Judas gets up and leaves the Passover supper. If you notice in John chapter 13, picking up in verse 27 now, John 13, verse 27, remember this is where John had just asked Jesus who it was. Jesus said, whoever I hand this piece of bread to after I've dipped it. And so he dipped it and he handed it to Judas. In John 13, verse 27, it says, now after the piece of bread, Satan entered him. Then Jesus said to him, what you do, do quickly. But no one at the table knew for what reason he said this to him. For some thought, because Judas had the money box, that Jesus had said to him, buy those things we need for the feast, or that he should give something to the poor. Having received the piece of bread, he then went out immediately, and it was night. So you see here how Judas gets up from the Passover and goes out to meet up with the chief priests, the Pharisees, the other Jewish leaders, and to lead that mob and the soldiers and everybody out to the garden to betray the Lord. 
Now, let's notice this, that we've seen where Jesus identified Judas to John and to Peter, and then Jesus, Jesus confronted Judas and essentially let Judas know, I know you're, what you're about to do. It's not that Judas didn't know, but that he's letting Judas know that he knew what he was up to. So there's nothing hidden from the Lord. But we go over to John chapter 18, John chapter 18, and notice this here, that Judas, of course, identifies Jesus. In John chapter 18 and verse 1, it says, When Jesus had spoken these words, he went out with his disciples of the brook Kidron, where there was a garden which he and his disciples entered. And Judas, who betrayed him, also knew the place, for Jesus often met there with his disciples. Then Judas, having received a detachment of troops and officers from the chief priests and Pharisees, came there with lanterns, torches, and weapons. Jesus, therefore, knowing all things that would come upon him, went forward and said to them, Whom are you seeking? They answered him, Jesus of Nazareth. Jesus said to them, I am he. And Judas, who betrayed him, also stood with them. So when this mob first comes out, John records for us that Jesus essentially steps forward to confront that mob. And he says, whom are you seeking? They say, well, Jesus of Nazareth. He says, I'm he. So he self-identifies here. But the mob is nervous And it talks about in verse 6, when he said, I am he, they fell back, they drew back and fell to the ground. They're nervous about what's unfolding here. It's a tense time. And so they're hesitant uh, to take action. Now, if you go over to Mark chapter 14, Mark 14, Mark leaves out this fact that Jesus identified himself and just goes straight to the idea of Judas identifying Jesus. So in Mark 14, verse 43, and immediately while he was still speaking, Judas, one of the 12, with a great multitude with swords and clubs, came to the chief, or came from the chief priests and the scribes and the elders. Now his betrayer had given them a signal saying, whomever I kiss, he is the one, seize him and lead him away safely. As soon as he had come, immediately he went up to him and said to him, Rabbi, Rabbi, and kissed him. Now, in Luke's account, in Luke 22, it tells us there when that was unfolding that Jesus said to Judas, are you betraying the Son of Man with a kiss? It's supposed to be a sign of friendship and affection, but instead, this was a kiss of death that Judas gave to the Lord. So, we see that Judas identified Jesus, gave a positive ID to make sure that the right man was arrested. And we might wonder, well, why would that happen? Why would he need to do that? Didn't they know who Jesus was? Well, yes, they knew who Jesus was. But remember, this is in the Garden of Gethsemane in the dead of night. Um, There's little light there, maybe even shadows if there's any type of moonlight that is present at the time. But there is the idea of the darkness, the night. You have many people. There could be chaos and confusion. So they want to make sure they get the right individual. And Judas is there to ensure that they do get Jesus of Nazareth. So that's why he said, the one that I kiss, he's the one. Take him and seize him. So let's notice now what happens after this. We're going to... um, not look at the trial of Christ at this point, but we're focusing on Judas and what becomes of him. If you go to Matthew chapter 27, Matthew chapter 27, you recall Judas, uh, or rather Jesus was arrested. He was taken before Annas and then before Caiaphas. And in the Jewish council, He was deemed worthy of death because he affirmed that he was indeed the Son of God. He affirmed or claimed deity, and so they convicted him of blasphemy. And in Matthew chapter 27, verse 3, it tells us how Judas reacts to what has unfolded since he betrayed Jesus in the garden just a couple of hours earlier. Now, it says in Matthew 27, verse 3, 
Then Judas, his betrayer, seeing that he had been condemned, was remorseful and brought back the 30 pieces of silver to the chief priests and elders, saying, I have sinned by betraying innocent blood. And they said, What is that to us? You see to it. Then he threw down the pieces of silver in the temple and departed and went and hanged himself. But the chief priest took the silver pieces and said, It is not lawful to put them into the treasury because they are the price of blood. And they consulted together and brought with them the potter's field to bury strangers in. Therefore, that field has been called the field of blood to this day. Then was fulfilled what was spoken by Jeremiah the prophet. And they took the 30 pieces of silver, the value of him who was priced, whom they, the children of Israel, priced, and gave them for the potter's field as the Lord directed me. So we see here that Judas when he learned that Jesus had been convicted, was remorseful of it, and went out and committed suicide. In Acts chapter 1, verses 18 and 19, it tells us there that when he committed suicide, that he fell down and his body broke open and his entrails gushed out, his intestines gushed out, spilled out of him. Now, whether that's because he hung there and the branch broke and he his body burst open on the rocks that were beneath, or if it's telling us that he hung there and after the body was there a little while that it fell off and it, it burst open at that point, uh, we're not exactly sure. But the idea is he, he died a terrible and what ended up being a very gruesome and disgusting death, a, a death that really was, in a sense, a reflection of Judas and his character, which we're going to see in just a little bit. Let's look at the lessons now that we can draw out of the account of Judas and his betrayal of the Lord. The first one that we want to notice is the fact that Satan subtly influenced Judas. We see that Judas was a man that had greed he was materialistic in his nature. If you go to John chapter 12, John 12, we're going to read an account that occurred six days before the Passover. And this account reveals to us the nature or the character of Judas. In John 12, verse 1, Then six days before the Passover, Jesus came to Bethany where Lazarus was, who had been raised from the dead, whom, or who had been dead, whom he raised from the dead. There they made him a supper, and Martha served, but Lazarus was one of those who sat at the table with him. Then Mary took a pound of very costly oil of spikenard, and anointed the feet of Jesus, and wiped his feet with her hair. And the house was filled with the fragrance of the oil. But one of his disciples, Judas Iscariot, Simon's son, who would betray him, said, Why was this fragrant oil not sold for three hundred denarii and given to the poor? This he said, not that he cared for the poor, but because he was a thief and had the money box and he used to take what was put in it. And this account tells us that Judas had this issue long before he went and made an agreement with the Jewish leaders to betray Jesus for money. You know, when he went to those leaders, he didn't agree to betray Jesus because he thought Jesus was a fraud or that Jesus was a liar or that Jesus was causing problems in society and hurting people or leading a rebellion and putting things in danger between the Jews and the Romans. He didn't betray him for any of those reasons. He betrayed him for 30 pieces of silver. So this tells us about his character. And it's so amazing when you step back and think about it. The desire for material things overrode Judas's experience with Christ. You think about everything that he experienced in that three to three and a half years he had spent with Jesus along with the other disciples. Think about the teaching that he heard. You know, Judas was one of those who sat at the feet of Jesus when he taught the Sermon on the Mount. Greatest lesson ever given, greatest speech ever given, Sermon on the Mount. And Judas was there and he heard that. 
and yet he was willing to betray the Lord. Judas heard the parables of the kingdom. Judas saw Jesus and heard the things that he taught. When Jesus confronted the Jewish leaders for their hypocrisy and for their sins and for their corrupt character, and Judas, in witnessing this, sort of brushed all of that aside when the opportunity arose and presented itself for him to get 30 pieces of silver. You know, Judas saw the miracles that confirmed the teaching of Jesus. He saw Jesus cause the blind to see and the lame to walk. And yet that evidently had little impact on him. He is one of the men who saw Jesus walk on water. He was in the boat with the others in the middle of the storm, in the middle of the lake, and he saw Jesus come and walk to them. He saw Peter get out of the boat and walk and then sink. And then Jesus rescued him. And they both got into the boat and the storm was calm. Judas saw all of that. Judas saw Lazarus resurrected from the dead. You know, it's just so amazing. All the things that Judas witnessed, all the things that he heard, the miracles that he saw, and that Judas was warned about all of this. Remember again in Mark chapter 14 what Jesus had said to them. In Mark chapter 14 and verse 41, then he came the third time. I'm sorry, uh, John or Mark chapter 14 verse 21. Mark 14 verse 21. The Son of Man indeed goes just as is written of him, but woe to that man by whom the Son of Man is betrayed. It would have been good for that man if he had never been born. You think about that. Judas has already made the agreement with the Jewish leaders to betray Jesus. And Jesus sitting there that Passover night brings up the subject of betrayal. And he very specifically says, Woe to that one that betrays the Son of Man. It would have been better if he had never been born. What was going through Judas's mind? You just have to wonder about that. But he, all that experience was overridden by his greed, by materialism. You see, Satan had a progressive influence on him. If you go back to John chapter 6, John chapter 6, much earlier in the time that Judas had spent with Jesus, in John 6, verse 70 and 71, Jesus answered, Did I not choose you, the twelve, and one of you is a devil? He spoke of Judas Iscariot, the son of Simon, for it was he who would betray him, being one of the twelve. You know, all the way back there, the devil had been working on Judas. It goes way back, if you will, in his life. And his character was eroding over time. And he went then and made that agreement with the chief priest. And then not only did he agree to it, but he followed through with the action. You know, it's one thing to plot, to plan, to, to think about, hey, here's something I want to do knowing that it's wrong, and it's another thing to follow through with that and to do it. And then, of course, it not only led him, that is, the devil not only led Judas from these various things that he did earlier in his life, and he was taking money out of the money box, to going in agreeing with 30 pieces of silver to betray Jesus, but then to actually take his own life, to hang himself because of the remorse that he felt. So you think about this. He went from being a thief to betraying the Son of God to committing suicide and thereby condemning his soul to an eternity of torment. That is the nature of Satan and of sin and how he progressively influences us and does it in such a subtle way. You know, Satan seeks to take us deeper and deeper into sin and to get us to go to that point of no return. Judas went to that point of no return when he committed suicide. At that point, he could not do anything about his sin. Now, you and I can get to the point of no return if we are overwhelmed with guilt for our sin and we decide to give up. We decide that it's not worth the struggle to live right, to do God's will, and we just give up. 
then that sort of is the point of no return if we've given up and we never come back to the Lord. But there is this point of no return, a literal point of no return, if we are living in sin and then we die. Whether we die of natural causes, we die of an accident, we die by our own hand. That is a point of no return because once we're dead, we can't do anything about our sin, about our guilt, about the things we've done to betray our Lord as Judas had betrayed the Lord. You know, the devil will take us from lying and deceiving to embezzling to being a thief like Judas was, maybe lying, deceiving to murder. And we see that there are many people in the Bible who were people of God at one time who ended up committing murder. He will take us from pride to anger, to acting out in violence toward others. You know, we are influenced by the devil little by little, but he takes us from those, if you will, smaller things to bigger things. He takes us deeper and deeper into sin. He may do things that we would see sometimes as not that big a deal, where we might stop reading our Bible and then we skip church occasionally and then we quit going to church altogether and we quit serving God or striving to serve God in any way. You know, those are small things that he leads us to along the way, but it ends up causing us to be separated from God and will end up eventually causing us to lose our souls. So one of the lessons we get out of Judas and the account of his betrayal of the Lord is how Satan subtly influences us. But another lesson that we get is we don't often see the full consequence of our sins. We don't see it as it's unfolding. You see, Judas was not all bad, right? He wasn't all bad because he was chosen by the Lord to be among the twelve and in his time with those 12, the others didn't recognize Judas as some type of wildly depraved, uh, immoral, ungodly man. No, he fit in with them. He, he was one who was accepted among them. And so Judas was not all bad. He had enough religious convictions to him and enough sincerity to him to be able to fit in among those disciples and to go around with the Lord and to experience all those things that we had talked about before. And so you have to wonder, what was it that Judas was thinking when he decided he would go and betray the Lord? Because as we noted before, after the Lord was convicted by the Jews, it said in Matthew 27 that he was remorseful and he went back to them. And so he regretted what he had done when he saw that he had betrayed an innocent man, when he saw that Jesus had been convicted. So what was he thinking before that? Was Judas thinking, well, you know, Jesus is just going to escape. I've seen him escape before. I saw him escape at the synagogue at Nazareth when he first started out and the people wanted to take him, throw him off the hill. Well, Jesus will just escape because I know he has this great power. Is that what Judas was thinking? Or was he thinking there's no way an innocent man is going to be convicted? It just isn't going to happen because they're not going to get the people to witness against him and convict him. And everybody's going to have a rational level head and see that Jesus is not guilty. And so he won't be convicted. You know, what was it that Judas was actually thinking to cause him to then regret the fact that Jesus had been convicted and he had betrayed an innocent man. You know, Satan has a way of showing us only what is pleasurable in the sin. You know, Hebrews chapter 11, verse 25 says, it talks about the passing pleasures of sin. Judas could only see the silver. Judas could only see that money and the gain he would get from that money, whether that's 
he planned on buying clothes or he planned on putting that toward property or home or who knows what he was going to do with that 30 pieces of silver. But he planned on doing something with it. And that's the only thing he could see. The benefit that that was going to bring him, the pleasure that that would bring him in his life. Maybe it's just the, the pleasure of having that 30 pieces of silver. But Satan blinded him to everything else. You know, the devil blinds us to the consequences that we face in sin. You know, in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, 2 Corinthians chapter 4, the Apostle Paul notes this. He says in 2 Corinthians 4 verse 3, But even if our gospel is veiled, it is veiled to those who are perishing, whose minds the God of this age has blinded, who do not believe lest the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine on them. The God of this world, that is Satan, blinds us to sin and its true nature and where it leads and the consequences of that sin. He blinded Judas. Judas could only see that silver. He couldn't see the fact that he was betraying an innocent man to death. He, he wasn't understanding that. He wasn't fully grasping what he was doing because when he did grasp what he was doing, he utterly regretted it. And Judas could not see when he took that 30 pieces of silver that it wouldn't be long before he killed himself. He couldn't see even when he was there in the garden and went up to Jesus and kissed him that a few hours later he would go and hang himself. Judas could not see that. He was blinded to the consequences of his sin. And let's understand this, that all sin has consequences. There is no sin that is free from consequences. In Galatians chapter 6, Galatians 6 verses 7 and 8, it says this, Do not be deceived. God is not mocked. For whatever a man sows, that he will also reap. For he who sows to his flesh will of the flesh reap corruption. But he who sows to the Spirit will of the Spirit reap everlasting life. You sow to the flesh, you will reap of the flesh. You'll reap that corruption. That corruption can come in many different forms. But understand this, it will come sooner or later. It is going to bring about terrible, destructive consequences. And that's either in this life or in the life that is to come. You think about in this life, how that lust leads to sexual immorality that can lead to disease or unwanted pregnancy. You think about how somebody's desire to party and leads them to drinking that may lead them to do other drugs. And those drinking and the drugs can lead to other consequences in life that that can lead to jail, that can lead to auto accidents. It can lead to disease, the, the body being corroded and corrupted by the intoxicants that are put in it. That is the idea of poisons being put in it. It can lead to death. You see, those sins lead to things that are undesirable in our life, things we don't want. But the devil, again, is blinding us to it. We need to be reminded of the consequences of sin and not blinded to those consequences. When we enter into sin, it brings harm to ourself and very often harm to others, especially to those who love us the most. And we should want to avoid that at all costs. But the greatest harm that sin does is it severs our relationship with God. It separates us from Him and thereby condemns our souls. So we need to be very careful and understand that sin has consequences, but the devil tries to blind us from those consequences. We cannot allow that to happen. Now, another thing we need to learn is that we cannot undo sin. We we can't just wipe it away. You know, in Matthew chapter 27, when Judas realized what had happened and he was remorseful and he went and he said he had sinned by betraying innocent blood, 
He gave the silver back, but that didn't solve the problem, did it? Then he went and he hanged himself, and that didn't solve the problem. Now, we understand he should have given the silver back because it was blood money, literally blood money. Now, he should not have hung himself. He should not have killed himself. But the action of giving back the money and the action of killing himself did not take care of the problem of the sin that he had committed. You know, in 2 Corinthians chapter 7, the Apostle Paul makes note of the difference between godly sorrow and worldly sorrow. In 2 Corinthians 7, verse 10, he says, For godly sorrow produces repentance, leading to salvation, not to be regretted. But the sorrow of the world produces death. And that is to be regretted. Now, the death he's really talking about here is the idea of spiritual death, separation from God. But we see in Judas's case, the guilt was so great that it led to literal death because, again, he ended up killing himself. So there's no undoing of our sin. Judas could not undo his sin. And we cannot undo our sin. We cannot take back hateful words. Once those words go out of our mouth, they're out. And you can't just reach out and pull them back in and act like, well, it never happened. I never said them. We can't erase theft or lying or adultery or murder. We can't just magically undo those things and reverse them, right? We can't do that. The only thing we can do is to repent. As Paul said in 2 Corinthians 10, that godly sorrow produces repentance. That's the only thing we can do relative to sin, an appeal to God to forgive us of that sin and submit to his will so that our sins can be forgiven. The Corinthians in 1 Corinthians chapter 6 had done this at one point in their life. When they heard the gospel, they had turned from their sin. In 1 Corinthians 6, notice verses 9 through 11 and how Paul describes that they went from being in sin to being saved. It says, Do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived, neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor homosexuals, nor sodomites, nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor extortioners will inherit the kingdom of God. And such were some of you, but you were washed, but you were sanctified but you are justified in the name of the Lord Jesus and by the Spirit of our God. If you go back to Acts chapter 18, Acts 18, where Paul was at Corinth, it tells us very specifically what they did in Acts chapter 18. And it tells us here that many of the Corinthians hearing, believed, and were baptized. So they were washed, they were sanctified, they were justified. They submitted to the will of God that at one time they were guilty of fornication and idolatry and homosexuality and being thieves and covetous and all those things. They were guilty of that, but they turned to the Lord. They gave up those sins. And so their godly sorrow led to repentance, which led them to submitting to God's will and being cleansed by the blood of the Lamb. We cannot just undo our sin, just like Judas could not undo it by giving the silver back or going and hanging himself. The only way to have that sin cleansed is to turn to God. You know, Judas's kiss was the greatest betrayal of any disciple of the Lord. When you think about that, how that he led the Lord to be crucified. He, he opened that door, if you will. It was treachery, and it was a betrayal of the divine Son of God. Now, our sin really has no less of an ultimate consequence personally than Judas's. Judas's made him guilty before God, and it condemned his soul. And our sin makes us guilty before God and condemns our soul. So we encourage you, as you examine your life, won't you... If you are guilty of sin, you're guilty of betraying the Son of God and all of sin to fall short of the glory of God. I have, everyone has. And if you recognize right now that that's your condition, 
and you have godly sorrow for that, you recognize you betrayed God. You have grieved him. You have turned away from him. And you want that guilt to be taken away. Then the only way to do that is to turn to the Lord. We want to help you to do that. We want to help you to repent, help you to submit to his command to be baptized, to have your sins washed away and help you to move forward in living a life of dedication and faithfulness to the Lord. So won't you let us know? Reach out to us, and we will help you. The members of the Newton Church of Christ thank you for watching this Bible study program. Our aim is to assist you to gain a better understanding of God's Word and encourage you to submit to the Lord. We invite you to send us an email with your Bible question or a comment about this episode. Please include your first name and the city or town where you live. We will respond with the Bible answer. You can send your email to contact at wordandsword.com. That's contact at wordandsword.com. What would you list as some of the top events in the life of Abraham? Would it be his call out of Ur of the Chaldees when God called him to follow him? Would it be the destruction of Sodom as he saw fire and brimstone fall from heaven and destroy the city of Sodom, the city of Gomorrah and the surrounding area? Would it be the birth of Isaac or maybe the sacrifice of Isaac? You know, when you look at the life of Abraham, there are many different things that we could point to that we might consider as amazing or significant or monumental events. There's one event, though, in his life that when we read about it, as we're reading through the book of Genesis, we might tend to overlook or we might easily pass by if we only had the Old Testament to tell us about the life of Abraham and the things he experienced. This account that we're going to study in this lesson in Genesis 14 is an interesting part of the life of Abraham, and it's minor, as some people view it, compared to other occasions, but it is deceptively significant in the overall Bible story. And we're going to see that as we go through and we pull lessons out of the account that we read of in Genesis 14. So let's begin by reading verses 1 through 9 and read about the war of the nine kings here in Genesis 14, verse 1. And it came to pass in the days of Amraphel, king of Shinar, Ariok, king of Elisar, Ketaleomer, king of Elam, and Tidal, king of nations, that they made war with Bera, king of Sodom, Bersha, king of Gomorrah, Shinab, king of Adma, Shimeber, king of Zeboim, and the king of Bela, that is Zoar. All these joined together in the valley of Siddim, that is the Salt Sea. Twelve years they served Ketaleomer, and in the thirteenth year they rebelled. In the fourteenth year, Ketaleomer and the kings that were with him came and attacked the Rephaim and Ashtoreth Karanaim the Zuzim in Ham, the Emim in Sheba Kirathaim, and the Horites in their mountains of Seir, as far as El Paran, which is by the wilderness. Then they turned back and came to En Mishpat, that is Kadesh, and attacked all the country of the Amalekites, and also the Amorites who dwelt in Hazan Tamar. And the king of Sodom and the king of Gomorrah, the king of Adma, the king of Zeboim, the king of Bela, that is Zoar, went out and joined together in battle in the valley of Siddim against Ketileomer, king of Elam, Tidal, king of nations, Amraphel, king of Shinar, and Ariok, king of Elisar, four kings against five. Now, as we read this here, what we see is there are four powerful Mesopotamian rulers and kings who come over and attack five weaker kings in the area of the Jordan Valley. So these four Mesopotamian rulers, it says that there is this Amraphel uh, that is king of Shinar. 
Shinar was in southern Mesopotamia or what we would call modern day Iraq. And then there is Ketileomer, king of Elam, that's eastern Mesopotamia, and that would be western Iran today. The Ariok, king of Elisar, and, and Tidal, king of nations, uh, where their territories were are unknown, but since the other two are from over in the Mesopotamian valley, then it's presumed that they were somewhere in that area as well. And they come against these five weaker kings, as are mentioned in Genesis 14, verse 2. And the location is the southern Jordan Valley. You have Sodom, Gomorrah, Abma, and Zeboim being four of them. And those four cities, remember, were overthrown in the destruction of Sodom. That is Sodom, Gomorrah, we know, of course, but also Abma and Zeboim. Uh, Deuteronomy 29 mentions that fact, of course, all that unfolded in Genesis 19. Now, the other one, the fifth one that is mentioned there is Bela, or as it says here, Zoar. Uh, Zoar was the city that Lot fled to when he was leaving or getting out of Sodom, when he was trying to escape the destruction there. And he begged God to spare him to let him to go into the city. So he went into Zoar and God spared Zoar. So anyway, that's where Lot fled in the destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah. Well, you have a war that is fought here. And it talks about this war of the four kings from Mesopotamia coming against these five kings from the Jordan Valley. And they put them under tribute for 12 years. And verse 4 says, 12 years they served Ketileomer. But in the 13th year they rebelled. And in the 14th year, those four kings came over and attacked the five kings to bring them into submission. Really, what it is, is for 12 years, these five kings paid the four tribute. And when they quit paying tribute, the four kings came as an act of retribution and to bring them back into line to get them to start paying tribute again. So this is a, a war that is taking place. Now, these 12 years of tribute, let's understand the initial war that led to that 12 years of tribute happened before Abraham left Haran. He was 75 when he left Haran in Genesis chapter 12. And then he was 86 when Ishmael was born. For 75 to 86 is 11 years. He was 75 in Genesis 12. He was 86 in Genesis 16 after our account in Genesis 14 here. So the war that led to 12 years of, of submission happened before Abraham left Haran and dwelt in the land of Canaan. So something interesting to note we'll come back to in just a little bit. But you have this war that's taking place, this act of retribution, this punitive war, if you will. And in the when it's unfolding, Lot gets caught up in it, caught up in the things that are happening here. And he and his family and his goods are taken captive. So let's read verse 10, Genesis 14, verse 10. And go down through verse 16 here. Now the valley of Siddim was full of asphalt pits, and the kings of Sodom and Gomorrah fled. Some fell there, and the remainder fled to the mountains. Then they took all the goods of Sodom and Gomorrah and all their provisions and went their way. They also took Lot, Abram's brother's son, who dwelt in Sodom and his goods, and departed. Then one who had escaped came and told Abram the Hebrew, for he dwelt by the terebinth trees of Mamre the Amorite, brother of Eshcol and the brother of Aner, and they were allies with Abram. Now when Abram heard that his brother was taken captive, he armed his 318 trained servants who were born in his own house and went in pursuit as far as Dan. He divided his forces against them by night, and he and his servants attacked them and pursued them as far as Hobah, which is north of Damascus. So he brought back all the goods and also brought back his brother Lot and his goods, as well as the women and the people. So, first of all, it mentions this Valley of Siddim. 
This Valley of Siddim, it says, is the Salt Sea or the Dead Sea as we know it better. So it's the Dead Sea area, and it says it's full of these asphalt pits. And some of the commentaries, some of the translations uh, give the idea that the king of Sodom and king of Gomorrah were stuck in these asphalt pits. So they sort of got trapped there or slowed down there. And the others, the allies that were with him, fled to the mountains. So they kind of left them out to dry, if you will, because the other kings have the advantage. The four Mesopotamian kings, more powerful, they have the advantage. They have these five kings and their people, their armies on the run. Well, when this happens, when the king of Sodom and the king of Gomorrah get stuck, it says there in verse 11 that their cities are sacked. So the cities are vulnerable when the kings are out there and can't get back to protect the city. So the provisions and the people and all of that are taken. They're taken away. And included in that, it mentions that Lot was dwelling in Sodom. And so as a consequence, he and his family and his possessions, his goods, were taken along with everybody else. But then it mentions that news comes to Abram. Uh, it says Abram the Hebrew here. Now, Zondervan's Pictorial Encyclopedia of the Bible says that that word Hebrew means one from the other side. The idea is from the other side of the river. So Abram was originally a resident, of course, of Mesopotamia, or of the Chaldees. He was resident there before he came over to Canaan land. So these people who are attacking are people from his native country, where he was born and lived for many years. But be that as it may, says he has 318 trained servants in the New King James Version that I have here. Now, Genesis Translation and Commentary by Robert Alter says that the, the reason this is translated that way, the trained servants, if you will, is because the word there in the original implies the idea of trained fighters, that the definition of the word here means or it's related to the idea of being unsheathed. So like you would unsheathe a sword, it's talking about these warriors um, are trained fighters. And it's, it's really like, to me, in my mind, Abraham is unsheathing his warriors. So these are trained servants. These are men who are soldiers. And then it talks about that they were born in Abram's house. So in other words, they're not mercenaries. They're not doing this for the money. They're doing it out of intense loyalty to Abram. So these 318 servants, he leads them in battle to chase down the enemy. He finally catches up to the enemy and they attack at night and they win over the five kings. Now, Abram has some allies with him. But the idea is that you, you have Abram, just an individual with 318 men, and then the allies and how many ever men they have, they're able to attack these four powerful kings and set them to flight and recover all their goods. You recall how Gideon, when he surrounded the enemy and his men broke their pitchers and shouted, you know, the sword of the Lord and of Gideon, and they sent their enemies to flight and defeated them. This is sort of like that thing about ancient warfare. And at night, there would be a lot of confusion, a lot of chaos going on, and even people turning against themselves. So it would be, you know, friendly fire, so to speak. But they defeat them and they recover all of their goods. In fact, it describes it in Hebrews chapter 7 as the slaughter of the kings. So Abram utterly defeated these men and recovered the people and the goods that had been taken captive. Now, Abram, when he's leaving, when he comes back, he's met by two kings. And this is really interesting here in Genesis chapter 4, beginning in verse 17, we want to read all the way down through 24. And the king of Sodom went out to meet him at the valley of Sheba, that is the king's valley, 
after his return from the defeat of Ketaleomer and the kings who were with him. Then Melchizedek, king of Salem, brought out bread and wine. He was the priest of God Most High. And he blessed him and said, Blessed be Abram of God Most High, possessor of heaven and earth, and blessed be God Most High, who has delivered your enemies into your hand. And he gave him a tithe of all. Now the king of Sodom said to Abram, Give me the persons and take the goods for yourself. But Abram said to the king of Sodom, I have raised my hand to the Lord God Most High, the possessor of heaven and earth, that I will take nothing from a thread to a sandal strap, and that I will not take anything that is yours, lest you should say I have made Abram rich, except only what the young men have eaten and the portion of the men who went with me, Aner, Eshcol, and Mamre, let them take their portion. So we see, first of all, we, we want to focus in on this Melchizedek, king of Salem. It says the king of Salem came out, to met, came out to meet Abram, and he brought with him bread and wine. He brought out nourishment and refreshments to him. So he brought, if you will, kind of a gift to Abram and something that was going to be beneficial and a blessing to him. And this really is the idea that he's coming out to congratulate him on his victory over these invaders who had come and wreaked havoc in the Jordan Valley. Now, he also gave Abram a blessing, specifically announced a blessing upon him. And it mentions here that he did this because he was priest of God Most High. This God Most High comes from the original El Elyon, and it's the idea of God above all gods or God of the universe. So they're talking about Almighty God. And this is the first priest, by the way, mentioned in the Bible, Melchizedek, priest of God Most High. It come out of Salem. We know it later as Jerusalem. Jerusalem. Um, but anyways, he comes out and he pronounces a blessing on Abram. And then Abram, it says in verse 20, gave him, Melchizedek, a tithe of all. So he gave him a tenth of all to show respect to the priest of God most high. Now you have the other king, the king of Sodom. Uh, he's different than the king of Salem. It says that the king of Sodom came out to meet him. And in verse 21, the king of Sodom said, give me the persons and take the goods for yourself. So instead of him coming to Abram with something to give him, he comes to ask of something. It's, it's almost the sense of a confrontation. There's no gift. There's no praise that he offers to Abram, but really has a demand of him. And he says, you know, give me the people and you take the goods for yourself. Now, according to the rules of war, especially in ancient times, that Abram going out to fight the battle, taking that risk, doing it at his own expense, he had the right to keep everything, the people and the possessions. But the king of Sodom here is saying, I want the people back, but you can keep the goods for yourself. Well, Abram refused to keep these things, and he makes note that he had raised his hand to God. He'd taken an oath before God that he would not keep anything, lest the king of Sodom had made Abram rich. And you think about that. You know, the king of Sodom, Sodom was known as a wicked place. Abram didn't want it, him going around and boasting or bragging in any way or even complaining well, the reason Abram is rich is because he got all my stuff. He got everything that was taken. When those kings took the stuff, Abram went and got it and he kept it for himself or I let him keep it. And so that's why Abram's rich. He, he didn't, Abram didn't want that taking place, that the king of Sodom would go around and have that kind of association or power over him, with him, if you will. So he didn't want that. He said he depended on God and he only wanted the provisions for the young men that were with him, what they'd eaten and needed along the way, and then what his allies would get as the spoils of war for going out and risking themselves and, and taking expense to go as well. So be that as it may, that's the account in Genesis 14. Now, what we want to do is back up and look at some lessons. The first lesson we want to note is the idea of poor choices. 
you think about Lot. You know, Lot was taken captive here. Now, why was Lot taken captive? In Genesis chapter 13, just prior to the account we just went through, remember that Abram and Lot had a dispute among their herdsmen. And Abram had told him, look, we shouldn't have this conflict. So you choose where you want to go. I'll go the other way. And let's not have this conflict anymore. Well, in Genesis chapter 13, it says that as um, Lot lifted his eyes in verse 10 and saw the plain of the Jordan, that it was well watered everywhere before the Lord destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah, like the garden of the Lord, like the land of Egypt, as far as uh, as you go toward Zoar, then Lot chose for himself all the plain of Jordan, and Lot journeyed east, and they separated from each other. Abram dwelt in the land of Canaan, and Lot dwelt in the cities of the plain, and pitched his tent even as far as Sodom. And it goes on to note, you know, Sodom was exceedingly wicked and sinful against the Lord. So their reputation was known at that time. Lot knew about that, but yet because it was well watered, because he thought, well, my flocks will fare better over here, then I'm going to go there. And he pitched his tent as far as Sodom. So he was close to Sodom when he made that decision and he settled down in that area. Well, in chapter 14, verse 12, again, it says that Lot dwelt in Sodom. So he went from being near Sodom to being in Sodom. So the choices that he made led him to being there. And he was going after wealth in spite of the wickedness that was in that society, in that city, in that culture that was there. And so he got caught up in it. When the war broke out and they came in and sacked Sodom, well, as a result, Lot, his people, his possessions were taken away. And, you know, it tells us that we have to be careful about the decisions we make and the people that we are around because we can get caught up with the wicked and their trouble. In Proverbs 23, verse 19, the wise man says this, Hear, my son, and be wise and guide your heart in the way. Do not mix with my wine bibbers nor with gluttonous eaters of meat, for the drunkard and the glutton will come to poverty, and drowsiness will clothe the man with rags. So don't be like them. Don't hang around them, because you're going to end up getting caught up in the things they're caught up in. You're going to end up with the problems they have by being around them. You know, we make poor choices. In Romans 3, verse 23, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Why do we sin? Well, we make a choice to sin. That's why we do it. And we make bad choices in our lives that bring consequences and troubles in our lives. Remember in James chapter 1, just to make a fine point on this idea of, you know, we make the decision to commit a sin. In James 1 verse 13 says, Let no one say when he is tempted, I am tempted by God, for God cannot be tempted by evil, nor does he himself tempt anyone. But each one is tempted when he is drawn away by his own desires and enticed. Then when desire has finished, has conceived, it gives birth to sin. And sin, when it is full grown, brings forth death. You see, we have these desires and the devil tempts us to fulfill them in a way contrary to God's will. And when we do that, we commit sin. So we make poor choices. And... We have to be careful, therefore, about the influences that are around us that would encourage us to make poor choices, that would lead us in the wrong way, that would discourage us from making the right choices. Now, there are some people who say, you know, it doesn't matter who I hang around. You shouldn't judge me by my friends. But there's a reality to you're pretty much the sum of the people you spend time with. And in 1 Corinthians 15, verse 33, it says, Do not be deceived. Evil company corrupts good habits. Evil company corrupts good habits. You know, we hang around people that use filthy language. 
we'll end up using filthy language. We hang around people who uh, drink, we're going to end up drinking. It's just the way that it goes. They do drugs. We'll end up doing drugs more than likely. It's just the, the nature of the way things work and relationships work and influence works. In Proverbs 13, verse 20, it says, He who walks with wise men will be wise, but the companion of fools will be destroyed. You know, the Bible is very clear about this idea of the influences of the people around us. And when we are associating with them, even if we aren't doing the same things that they are doing, maybe we're not cursing, maybe we're not drinking or doing the drugs. But when we're around them and there's a consequence that comes as a result of their behavior, we're more than likely going to face that exact same consequence just because we're there with them. That's what happened with Lot. He made a poor choice to live near Sodom and then to live in Sodom. And we make poor choices and face the consequence of that. Lot was taken captive. And of course, when we make poor choices, we're taken captive in sin. But there's another lesson here. Lot was taken captive, but then he was rescued. He was redeemed, if you will. So there's a lesson of redemption and Abram, we see, had compassion on Lot. He didn't have bitterness or contempt. You know, when there was a dispute between the herdsmen, Abram had the right to tell Lot which way he needed to go because Abram was the senior. Abram was the older. Abram was the uncle. Lot was the nephew. So Abram could have just told Lot what to do. But he was gracious and kind, and he let Lot make the choice. Well, Lot made a poor choice. Abram, at this point, when he's taken captive, didn't just say, that's too bad. He got what was coming to him. He wasn't angry. He wasn't bitter. He wasn't indifferent, even. He didn't say, eh, whatever. He had compassion on him. And you know, God has compassion on us. We make poor choices. God is not pleased with the sin, not at all. But he has compassion on us. We make poor choices, and the reality is, when we commit sin, we are deserving of death. Have you ever noted Romans chapter 1? Romans 1, and beginning here in verse 28, says, And even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge... God gave them over to the base mind to do those things which are not fitting, being filled with all unrighteousness, sexual immorality, wickedness, covetousness, maliciousness, full of envy, murder, strife, deceit, evil mindedness. They are whispers, backbiters, haters of God, violent, proud, boasters, inventors of evil things, disobedient to parents, undiscerning, untrustworthy, unloving, unforgiving, unmerciful who knowing the righteous judgment of God, that those who practice such things are deserving of death, not only do the same, but also approve of those who practice them. Now, some of these we might point to and say, yeah, definitely deserving of death. You know, if you are someone who is a murderer, well, you're deserving of death. But what about someone who's disobedient to parents or someone who's proud? or a boaster, or someone who has envy. What about that? Well, the Bible says they're deserving of death, and, and the idea is we, we forfeited our right here. But God has compassion on us, even though we do things that really should end up in us forfeiting our right to life, and we end up being separated from God. We deserve to be separated from Him. You know, God doesn't have bitterness or contempt or indifference toward us, but God loves us. You know, John 3, 16, For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son, that whoever believes in Him should not perish but have everlasting life. God loves us in spite of the fact that we were caught up and have been caught up and maybe are caught up in sin. Remember what Jesus said on the cross when He was hanging there, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. 
He was talking about the people who were responsible for putting him on the cross, for torturing him to death. He was calling on the Father to be merciful toward those individuals. So God is compassionate toward us. In spite of the fact that we've made poor choices, in spite of the fact we've been caught up in those, the consequences of those choices, God's wanting to redeem us. God is wanting to rescue us like Abraham rescued Lot. But then there's another lesson here of faith. You go back to Genesis chapter 14 and remember when the king of Sodom confronted Abram and he told him, you give me the people and you keep the provisions for yourself, that Abram responded that he had raised his hand to the Lord God most high, possessor of heaven and earth, that he would not take anything from a thread of a sandal strap, that he will not take anything that was the king of Sodom's, lest the king of Sodom said that he had made Abram rich. In other words, Abram was trusting in God. He did not trust in men. He did not put his faith in men. And he didn't even put his faith in military conquest that he was returning from a great victory. But he wasn't putting his trust, his faith in that, in the physical, in the material. But he was putting his trust and his assurance in God. And remember what God said in Genesis 15, verse 1. So right after this account, notice what God says to Abram. After these things, the word of the Lord came to Abram in a vision, saying, Do not be afraid, Abram. I am your shield and your exceedingly great reward. Think about that. It's so beautiful how Abram went out and he fought this battle, the idea of a shield. Abram went out and captured all these material goods along with the people. And that was his reward, right? Supposedly. But he says, no, I don't want to keep any of it. But God tells Abram then, I'm your shield. I'm your protector. I'm your power. And I am your great reward. I'm the one who is going to bless you. So God gave Abram assurance of his love and his care for him. And, you know, we need to be like Abram and not trust in men. If you notice in 2 Corinthians chapter 1, the Apostle Paul here teaches us a lesson and makes a note of the fact that we can't trust in men. We can't even trust in ourselves. In 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 8, beginning, it says, For we do not want you to be ignorant, brethren, of our trouble which came to us in Asia, that we were burdened beyond measure above strength, so that we despaired even of life. Yes, we had the sentence of death in ourselves, that we should not trust in ourselves, but in God who raises the dead, who delivered us from so great a death, and does deliver us, in whom we trust that He will deliver us. See, we can't trust in men. Even the best of men are weak at times. They can't come through with their promises, and they let us down for one reason or another. That happens. But God is always there, and we can always count on Him. So we can't trust in men, but we can trust in God. We can't trust in riches either. You know, so many people are pursuing riches in this life. They put their faith, their trust in those riches. Abram didn't put his trust in riches, and we can't put our trust there either. In 1 Timothy 6, verse 17, it says, Command those who are rich in this present age not to be haughty, nor to trust in uncertain riches, but in the living God who gives us richly all things to enjoy. You know, if you've lived any amount of time, you recognize, you know, one day you may have material goods only to lose them the next day. One day you may have a job, the next day you don't. There, These things happen in life. Many things out of our control, sometimes it's because of our poor choices. But the riches are uncertain. So we can't trust in them, but we can trust 
in the living God. We can put our faith in him always. In First Timothy 4, verse 10, For this end we both labor and suffer reproach because we trust in the living God who is the Savior of all men, especially of those who believe. We trust in the living God. So we're willing to put up with difficulties, with sacrifices, with hardship, willing to go through suffering because we trust in God. And that's what Abram was declaring to the king of Sodom. I trust in God, not in you and not in the material things that I captured in this war, but I trust in God. You and I need to trust in God. We need to have faith in him always. Now, the other lesson we want to learn is the surety of God's plan. And this is the one that, to me, is really amazing out of Genesis 14. In this chapter of Genesis chapter 14, you, know, you read through it, and it seems like some type of random, ordinary event. When you look at it in light of world history, this seems to be incidental. It's just another event in ordinary circumstance in the ancient world with no lasting geopolitical consequences. There's not an empire that falls here. There's not an empire that's built here. So it's not significant as far as world history is concerned, the history of the nations seemingly, apparently. Now, when you get down to the end of the account and this Melchizedek comes out, he's only mentioned or discussed in three verses, 18, 19, and 20. A thousand years later, in Psalm 110, he's mentioned again. And you may recall that psalm. It's a very famous psalm in Psalm 110, and let's notice verse 4 here very specifically. It says, The Lord has sworn and will not relent. You are a priest forever according to the order of Melchizedek. So Melchizedek appears around 2000 B.C., the time of Abram. Abraham, we better know him as. He's mentioned again in one verse in Psalm 110, a thousand years later. And then another thousand years later, he's mentioned in Hebrews chapters 5, 6, and 7. Now, very brief mention in 5 and 6, but more extended discussion of him in chapter 7. And this is where we understand that Melchizedek is really plays a big part in God's plan of salvation, or at least the, the concept of Melchizedek. And let's notice that here in Hebrews chapter 7, verse 1. For this Melchizedek, king of Salem, priest of most high God, who met Abraham returning from the slaughter of the kings, blessed him, to whom also Abraham gave a tenth part of all, first being translated king of righteousness, then also king of Salem, meaning king of peace, without father, without mother, without genealogy, having neither beginning of days nor end of life, but made like the Son of God, remains a priest continually. Now consider how great this man was, to whom even the patriarch Abraham gave a tenth of the spoils. And indeed, those who are of the sons of Levi, who received the priesthood, have a commandment to receive the tithes from the people according to the law, that is, from their brethren, though they have come from the loins of Abraham. But he whose genealogy is not derived from them received tithes from Abraham and blessed him who had the promises. Now, beyond all contradiction, the lesser is blessed by the better. Here mortal men receive tithes, but there he receives them of whom it is witnessed that he lives. Even Levi, who received tithe, who receives tithes, paid tithes through Abram, so to speak." for he was still in the loins of his father when Melchizedek met him. And what the Hebrew writer here is arguing is that the priesthood of Christ is different and superior to the priesthood of Levi. And he goes on to discuss the idea that that means there's been a change of law because Christ couldn't serve as a priest under the old law. So there's a new law in effect. That old one's been done away with. It's no longer in effect. But be that as it may, he says here that Jesus, 
is after the order of Melchizedek. And it talks about Melchizedek having no genealogy, no mother, no father, you know, no end of days, no beginning of life, or, or no beginning of days or end of life. And what it's saying is, you know, in the Old Testament account, Melchiz Melchizedek appears and he's gone. Like he comes out of nowhere and then he's gone. It doesn't record his birth, doesn't record his genealogy, doesn't record his death, doesn't record any of that. And so it's like he's a priest continually, right? And it's saying that Christ has that priesthood of Melchizedek, a continual priest. Jesus had no beginning, right? Because he's eternal. He has no end because he's eternal. He has no genealogy, therefore. So think about what is happening here in Genesis chapter 14. Genesis 14 is what gives meaning to Psalm 110, right? When when you, and, and Hebrews chapter 7, rather, gives meaning to Genesis 14 and Psalm 110. How could you understand what's really happening in Genesis 14 or the statement that the psalmist makes in Psalm 110, you are a priest forever according to the order of Melchizedek? How could you ever understand that without the explanation of Hebrews chapter 7? You know, Jews can't explain what's going on here. They can't tell you the significance of that. It takes the New Testament and a belief in the New Testament to truly understand that. And what we are seeing here is God's hand was guiding the events of the ancient world. Remember, the war that originally broke out between the four kings of Mesopotamia and the five kings of the Jordan Valley and putting them under tribute for 12 years took place before Abram left Haran. And then the kings here are going to war with each other without any regard to Abram at all, or any regard to God or Melchizedek. These matters on the world stage are considered incidental and insignificant, yet they're key to the redemption of mankind that unfolded over thousands of years. The whole reason, the whole reason that these kings went to war is so that Abram and Melchizedek could meet. To give that analogy, you're a priest forever according to the order of Melchizedek, to explain to us in the book of Hebrews how the priesthood of Christ is superior and greater than the priesthood of Levi. And it's different than the priesthood of Levi. And there's this change of the law then that occurred with Jesus giving his life on the cross. So if God worked all of that out in world history, among all those different peoples, among all the kings, among all the armies, among those city-states, if you will, and unfolding the plan of redemption, we understand that he can be trusted and we can be assured of his word and its fulfillment today. You know, Abram stands as a giant in biblical history. He's key in the role of the redemption of man and his faith in God and compassion for fellow man are exemplary and something we need to follow after. And the account of his rescue of Lot and meeting with Melchizedek are monumental in the Bible story. And El Elyon, God, the same God who ruled then, is the God that rules now. And we can have full faith and confidence in Him. We can go out and face the battles of life as we're striving to rescue others, to help bring them, to redeem them, if you will. As we're striving to do that, we can know that God is working with us in striving to do that. But maybe, maybe you're the one who's captive now. Maybe you're the one who needs to be rescued. Well, God is looking on you now with compassion and wants you to be redeemed. And we're here to assist in that, to serve you, to help you to come back to God. And if we can do that, please reach out and let us know. This Bible study program is brought to you by the Newton Church of Christ located in Newton, North Carolina. We invite you to call 828 828 
to talk to one of our members and ask your Bible question. Some of the questions we receive will be used on a future episode of the program to help others who may have the same question. Again, that number is 828-465-3009. With this lesson, we want to begin a study of the books of First and Second Peter. We just want to start with a few simple facts. You know, First Peter was written around 64, 65 A.D. Uh, Peter mentions the location at the end of the book of being in Babylon, and there's dispute among some people whether that's literal or figurative. But Wherever he was, the writing was inspired of God, and it is to be received as absolute truth. The world stage, let's get a little bit of background. The world stage at this time, as you think about it, you know, this was the time of the Roman Empire. The Roman Empire at this time stretched from, you know, around Great Britain, uh, up in Europe there, down to North Africa. It was from the west in Spain or Iberia, as it was known at the time, over to Cappadocia into the region of Turkey as we know it today. Uh, the Roman Empire was very powerful and brought safety to the territories that they controlled because, of course, the legions that would enforce the law and ensure safety for people. But also with this system, uh, you had commerce and very great commerce that took place uh, within the empire, but then also with other neighboring states at times they would have commerce. But That was the ruling power of the Roman Empire at this time. The technology and travel of the time, um, the way they communicated was via letter or maybe through word of mouth. But that was pretty well it. But as you study this, as you understand, Peter writing a letter here, this letter uh, was widely circulated. And so communication, uh, while we might think of it as very ancient, as we might think of it as very hindered. Uh, The reality was the people back in that time were able to communicate quite well. Uh, The travel that they had was on the roads uh, that were built by the Roman Empire. But even though they were built by the empire for the moving of the troops and for the uh, accommodation of commerce, in reality, if you take a biblical perspective, those roads were built for the spread of the gospel, which uh, someone probably traveled those roads in delivering this letter from Peter uh, to the people who received it. But travel essentially was either on foot or by animal on land. And then in the sea, of course, a sailing ship is how they would get around. Sometimes, of course, they would use oars, but mostly uh, sailing ships to get around. The weapons of the time were the sword, uh, a bow, a spear maybe, and then, of course, catapult for bigger things, things like that. So you you look at this, think think about what's happening at the time that 1 Peter is written. What was the culture like? What was life like for those people? What did they see around them? Uh, The nation of Israel at this time, of course, was subject to the Roman Empire. Uh, But Israel, as it always been, was in a strategically important spot as a land bridge between Africa, Asia, and Europe. Now, Galilee, where Jesus and the apostles came from, was a relatively insignificant uh, part of the world. Even within the nation of Israel, they considered it rather insignificant. But Israel was in a position to keep the knowledge of the one true God alive in the world as people would pass through that area going from one continent to the other, from one region to the other, uh, they would learn about Jehovah God. They'd be reminded of Jehovah God, of these Jews who were monotheistic in their religion. Now, if you go back in biblical history, remember there had been the 400 years of silence, and then John the Immerser came on the scene and began to preach about 
the coming of the Messiah. He prepared the way. He paved the way for that. Uh, now, the thing that's interesting about John is that he had a direct impact on Peter, uh, at least through his family. But Peter would have been one of the ones that heard John preaching. And in John chapter 1, if you remember there in verse 35, it says that, Again, the next day, John stood with two of his disciples and looking at Jesus as he walked, he said, Behold, the Lamb of God. The two disciples heard him speak and they followed Jesus. Then Jesus turned and seeing them following, said to them, What do you seek? They said to him, Rabbi, which is to say when translated teacher, where are you staying? He said to them, Come and see. They came and saw where he was staying and remained with him that day. Now it was about the tenth hour. One of the two who heard Jesus speak and followed him was Andrew, Simon Peter's brother. He first found his own brother Simon and said to him, We have found the Messiah, which is translated the Christ. And he brought him to Jesus. Now when Jesus looked at him, he said, You are Simon, the son of Jonah. You shall be called Cephas, which is translated a stone. So John came onto the scene, <clears throat> had an impact upon Andrew. Uh, very specific here as it's recorded. And then Andrew goes and gets uh, Peter and takes him to Jesus and they are introduced to one another. And then, of course, Peter was chosen as one of the Lord's apostles that he would be with Jesus and see many things. One of the closest men to Jesus in his time on earth. And then if you fast forward from that time to the church being established in Acts 2, and that was around 29 AD, the one who did the preaching of the focus of the preaching that day, as the Bible records it in Acts 2, was Peter, as he preached to the Jews on the day of Pentecost. And he opened the door of the kingdom there and called men to come to Christ, believe in him, to repent and to be baptized. And so it says there in Acts 2, verse 47, the Lord added to the church daily those who are being saved. Well, you keep going forward in time in Acts 10, it's Peter again who is preaching and opening the door of the gospel to the Gentiles in that case. So in Acts 2 was the Jews, in Acts 10 was the Gentiles. And that's what Jesus had meant when he told Peter, I give you the keys of the kingdom. He gave him the power to open the door of the kingdom to the people of the world, to the Jews, and then to the Gentiles again. And when the gospel was preached, it started there in Jerusalem went to Judea, went to Samaria, and it went to the uttermost part of the earth, or uh, what we might look at it from a different perspective, it began to spread very rapidly throughout the Roman Empire and even beyond. And by the time that First Peter is written, it had been around and been preached for 30 some odd years and again, the, the date of the writing was around 64, 65 AD, and Roman persecution wasn't far off. Uh, remember, the Romans came against Jerusalem in AD 70, and then, of course, there is a great persecution that arises later in the century, really the last part of the first into the second century AD. Now, let's Think about Peter. There, there's some background there about the world, about what's going on, the gospel being established and going forward. But um, what about Peter, the man? You know, Peter, Mark chapter 1, verses 21 and 29 tells us, lived in Capernaum. He had a, a house there and he had a family. In Mark chapter 1, verse 30, of course, it reveals to us that Peter was married because uh, his wife's mother was sick and remember Jesus healed her. So Peter was married. And in 1 Peter 5, Peter describes himself as an elder. And one of the qualifications to be an elder or a bishop or a shepherd uh, was for a man to be married with children who were faithful servants of God. And so we know Peter was married. We know that Peter had children. His vocation of course, before he met the Lord, then he practiced, uh, at least in part, after he met the Lord, uh, he was a fisherman. 
So he worked at a trade, if you will, as a fisherman. And he worked in that business with both James and John. And he was close friends with James and John. And they worked together in the fishing business. And Peter, we know, also was a very religious man. Uh, He would not have been invited or called to be an apostle by Jesus if he was not a man of deep, sincere religious convictions, and he lived that out in his life. And so he spent about three and a half years with the Lord, and again, as one of his closest companions. So again, looking at the broad perspective, thinking about the writing of 1 Peter, by the time that is written, Peter had been preaching the gospel for over 30 years years. And during that time, he had faced many challenges. If you go to the book of Acts, you see some of those challenges that he faced. Remember, he was preaching on the day of Pentecost. He was preaching in Jerusalem. He was preaching at the temple. And in Acts chapter 4, verse 1, it says, Now as they spoke to the people, the priest, the captain of the temple, the Sadducees came upon them, being greatly disturbed that they taught the people and preached in Jesus the resurrection from the dead. And they laid hands on them and put them in custody until the next day, for it was already evening. So Peter and John, other apostles, were arrested here. And later in the chapter, it tells us that they were threatened. In verse 18, so they called them, and commanded them not to speak at all, nor to teach in the name of Jesus. They were told, you can't do this anymore, and they threatened them. And you keep going in chapter 5, and Peter and the other apostles are arrested again in Acts chapter 5. And then at the end of that chapter, it says in verse 40, and they agreed with him, that is, they agreed with Gamaliel not to kill them right then and there, But it says they agreed with him and called for the apostles and beaten them. They commanded that they should not teach at all or teach. They should not speak in the name of Jesus and let them go. So they departed from the presence of the council, rejoicing that they were counted worthy to suffer shame for his name. So the apostles are arrested multiple times. They're threatened. The second time they are beaten to try to get them to stop preaching the gospel. That's Peter. Peter dealt with that external pressure and opposition, the persecution that came from the Jews at this time in Acts 4 and Acts chapter 5. In Acts chapter 15, many years later, there was a dispute that arose among the disciples about whether or not Gentiles had to be circumcised and observed other things from the Old Testament in order to be saved and to be right with God. And Peter, dealing with that conflict, stood up and said, no, they do not need to do that. And he pointed back to his time of preaching to Cornelius in Acts 10 when the gospel was open to the Gentiles. So Peter dealt with the external persecution as we talked about a moment ago, but he also dealt with internal conflict and strife among brethren and the error, the false doctrine that had come. So Peter had gone through a lot of different things in his time of preaching the gospel, including corruption among the disciples and and the failing of their morals. Ananias and Sapphira in Acts 5, when they lied about the amount of money they were giving to the apostles or laying at the apostles' feet. So Peter's been through it. Um, He's had a life of boldness in preaching the word, but also a life of difficulty and trial. Now, when you look at him as recorded in the New Testament, you know that Peter was a bold man, but rash at times, and it got him into trouble on more than one occasion. But he was inquisitive. He wanted to know the truth. He wanted to understand that. And he had deep convictions and was really protective of the Lord. And uh, he had the wrong understanding of the Lord talking about him going to the cross. And Peter tried to tell him, no, that's not going to happen in Matthew chapter 16. But he was a man who was like you and me. He had weaknesses at times. And he denied the Lord. 
This is Peter who wrote First Peter. And, but after the resurrection, we know that Peter was restored in John chapter 21 and was told that he would be a martyr for the Lord. And yet, in spite of that, he goes out and boldly declares Jesus as the Christ. Again, at the heart of Judaism in the temple to a crowd, some of whom were guilty of crucifying the Son of God. So Peter was a bold man, suffered persecution for the sake of the Lord. Now, as we think about all of this, let's understand Peter was someone just like you and me. He was a working man. He worked to earn, to provide for himself and for his family. And he had a family and he had deep religious convictions. And you and I, just by the nature of you being here and watching this, you have some type of religious conviction. You have some type of desire to know about the will of God and to serve God. And so that's who Peter is, one who had dedicated himself to the Lord. Now, the letter itself was written to Gentile Christians. If you go over to 1 Peter and notice chapter 1, verse 1, it says, Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ, the pilgrims of the dispersion in Pontius, Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia. These pilgrims of the dispersion, some people read that and they think, oh, well, he's talking about Jews. No, he's really using that, that language to refer to God's chosen people in the New Testament, which are Christians. And you can see that very clearly that these are Gentiles in 1 Peter 2, verse 9. It says, but you are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, his own special people, that you may proclaim the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light, who once were not a people, but are now the people of God who had not obtained mercy, but now have obtained mercy. So that and other places in the letter tells us that he's writing to Gentile Christians to help them in their life. And so... Let's understand the purpose is to help them as they're facing trials. First Peter 1 verse 6, notice this. In this you greatly rejoice, though now for a little while, if need be, you have been grieved by various trials. There was persecution ahead of them. There, there were things they were going through now and in harder things that they would be going through in the future. And so he's writing them to prepare them for the trials and to tell them to take courage. In 1 Peter 4, verses 12 and 13, he says, Beloved, do not think it strange concerning the fiery trial, which is to try you as though some strange thing happened to you, but rejoice to the extent that you partake of Christ's sufferings, that when his glory is revealed, you may also be glad with exceeding joy. You know, he's telling them, take courage, take hope in this time of great trial and suffering that you are experiencing and you will be experiencing. The New American Commentary on First and Second Peter says that there is perseverance uh, that is to be exhibited in a godly life. It makes note of this, that Peter talks about being good citizens in chapter two, talks about being model slaves in the same chapter. Chapter three, he talks about those wives who would be gentle wives and husbands who would be understanding husbands. Chapter uh, chapter three, that is, with gentle wives and husbands. And then chapter five about being faithful shepherds or elders or bishops um, of a, a church. And then the Expositor's Bible Commentary makes these observations. You have Peter writing to people who share a common faith and share common problems. You know, when Peter writes to them about the trials they're going through, it's not like he's writing from an ivory tower, if you will. It's not as though Peter never experiences and said, hey, guys, just keep a stiff upper lip and keep going. No, he had been through it. He had suffered. He had been beaten. He was almost executed in Acts 12. Remember when James was beheaded, that Peter had was in jail at that time, and God led him out. God sent an angel to lead Peter out of jail. But Peter had been through it. Peter had been through hard times and faced great opposition and persecution. So as he writes to them, he's writing from one who has walked the walk. 
And he is telling them, here's how you deal with problems in a pagan world. You're surrounded by this paganism. You're surrounded by ungodliness. You're surrounded by opposition. Here's how you deal with it. You're going to be misunderstood. You're going to be treated cruelly. That is true. And the conflict is going to increase over time. And so you need to be prepared for it. And he's writing them to encourage them in this. Now, First Peter was written for people in the ancient times, but this message has been preserved for you and I today. You know, if we have biblical convictions, like marriages between a man and a woman, and homosexual marriage, same-sex marriage, is wrong. It's contrary to the will of God. You know, the society around us gets angry about that. Or, you know, if we oppose abortion and say, you know what, a, a baby in the womb is a life. That's a human being in there. And we say that life should be preserved and there's no right to take that life. Then the world around us gets angry and furious at us. Or if we say, you know, this world, this universe is a result of the hand of a, an almighty creator, then the world around us mocks us and ridicules us, tries to tell us that, you know, we believe in a myth or something like that. You know, we face similar things to what they face in the first century. And first Peter is there to help to give us courage and strength as we face this opposition, this ridicule, and this persecution. So I look forward to studying First Peter with you in the days ahead. We didn't spend a whole lot of time in reading the Scripture, uh, going through that in this particular lesson. We're just trying to, to get a background on First Peter, and then, Lord willing, next time we will spend time together in digging through the book and getting down into the text. So uh, be prepared for that. Be ready for that. Look forward to that. Start reading through First Peter. Be very helpful. Um, and then on the next occasion, we can study together through the book. Thank you for watching The Word and Sword brought to you by the Newton Church of Christ located in Newton, North Carolina. Our aim is to assist you to gain a better understanding of God's Word and encourage you to follow the Lord in all things. Do you want to study more about God's Word, His saving plan for man, and the church Jesus established? Please let us know, and we are happy to provide you with materials for additional study. Call and request a correspondence course that will be sent via U.S. mail, or to be added to the church's quarterly mail-out of the bulletin, or a copy of the outlines of our lessons. Call us at 828-465-3009. Again, that number is 828-465-3009. If there is no answer, please leave a message and we will fulfill your request or return your call as soon as possible. You may also go to wordandsword.com for many more Bible study materials including past episodes of this TV program, or scroll down on the homepage to take a quiz and test your Bible knowledge. That's again, wordandsword.com. Visit our Facebook page, facebook.com slash wordandsword. Leave a comment about the program or ask a Bible question. Again, that's facebook.com slash wordandsword. If you live within driving distance, we invite you to join us in one of our services and meet us in person. We meet on Sundays at 10 a.m. for Bible class and 11 a.m. for worship. On Wednesday, we have Bible classes at 7 p.m. Our classes are for those of all ages. We are located at 656 St. James Church Road, Newton, North Carolina. That is 656 St. James Church Road, Newton, North Carolina. Our contact information once more. The phone, 828-465-3009. Email, contact at wordandsword.com. Our Facebook page is facebook.com slash wordandsword. Our website is wordandsword.com. And our address is 656 
St. James Church Road, Newton, North Carolina. 